Pleasure. All right, peace and blessings, everyone. And welcome back to our IG Live podcast, Unveiling Love, Stories of Community and Social Change. You know, this is where we interview Oakland artists and community leaders, and they discuss their defining moments that shape their efforts in cultivating community safety, community resources, um, unity, and solidarity. This is a, a, a part of our campaign, Love Over Fear Oakland, organized by our family at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. You know, there's so much negativity going on in the media, news, and we want to highlight those that are doing the real work of love, working for our beloved Oakland. And we have a great opportunity to discuss and learn more about the needs of our Oakland community. And one of those needs is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and, you know, studies show that the prevalence of depression, PTSD, anxiety tends to be higher amongst immigrants and refugees due to language barriers, cultural differences, institutional discrimination, restricted use of health uh, services, even children separated from migrating uh, parents are at a high risk as well. So with all that is going on, genocide in Palestine and what's going on all over the world, it is very important that we learn more about these issues and how we can address them, how we can take care of them in our own community. And one of the leaders that can help with that today is Elijah Chum from Siri Center for Empowering Refugees and Immigrants. It's an Oakland-based nonprofit organization that offer culturally attuned, holistic mental health services to refugees and immigrants affected by war, genocide, um, torture, deportation. He's also the founder and director of New Light Program, a wellness outreach program that tends to the individuals impacted by incarceration and deportation. It is the first uh, to provide an online mental health services to the community in, uh, members um, you know, deported to Cambodia. And we get an incredible opportunity to learn more about this. Welcome, Elijah. Oh my gosh. Um, just to my, all my siblings across uh, the globe and the world. And Amina, thank you so much for such a warm welcome. And um, again, I feel so honored, so humbled. I'm a big fan of Interfaith. Um, you know, I wouldn't even be here without Interfaith. Um, and the coalition and all the partnerships and mentors that I've had on this path and this journey. And I'm seeing so many names that are joining on the live. This is also my first Instagram live, everyone. Yeah. Um, so if you all know me, you know I'm not like completely tech savvy. So um, I appreciate that I'm in the space. Um, and I, you know, feel very, again, humbled and honored. I'm a human being like all of you trying to understand how to uplift ourselves in solidarity, um, to stand alongside each other, um, and to do this intergenerationally, and um, to also understand my my place in this world. And um, so I just thank you all for being here, and I thank you for this opportunity, Amina. And I hope this next you know few moments of just open, convivial, open-hearted conversation can you know bring some light to the world and bring some peace to both of us too. It's an honor, it's an honor to have you. And I want the audience to know a little bit more about you. I know you're an artist uh, as well before you got into this work, but can you share with us a little bit about your background, your family background and how you got into this work? Yes, um, I'm second generation Khmer. I was born in a place called Rochester, Minnesota, known for the Mayo Clinic. Um, I was born in 1982, the same year my parents arrived in Rochester in snow mm -hmm. as genocide survivors from the Thai refugee camps. So I say I'm second generation to distinguish that our mothers gave birth in sometimes three countries in various conditions. Um, mm -hmm. My mom gave birth to my oldest sister from the 1.5 generation um, in 1977 in genocide, in war. Um, in, in these 
uh, labor camps um, where there was such a lack of nutrition, such a dismantling of families, um, intense labor, intense starvation, and really family separation, something that uh, a theme we're still enduring to this day. And I uphold my siblings and my mom because, you know, I'm here because of them. And the same with my brother who was born in the refugee camps of Thailand. Um, and although he was only a, f a year when he arrived to Rochester, there's such a difference between all of us, between what my mom endured while giving birth. Part of, you know, mental health and decolonizing mental health, if we can add that framework in this conversation, is to really understand our mothers and our, our parents and what we came from and what did they have to carry? Who did they carry? And, and what are we carrying now? And part of this journey is to really, um, you know, part of my healing journey has, to, has been to understand my own Khmer language um, and to understand and hone my own mental health and wellness skills so that I can hold space for my parents to tell me these stories. Um, stories that I felt like they couldn't reach or give or stories that were sent in silent messages um, when I was in Rochester growing up. Um, pieces of like a mystery of a land of Cambodia that I could not fathom or understand, you know, why we were here to begin with. Why were we in Rochester? Um, though, just to give more background, um, my parents um, during the refugee camps um, became a Christian there they were baptized and my father you know believed he had a divine intervention um, with God and you know that is part of his journey that he wanted to serve um, his you know serve God and and that's what brought him to to Rochester and in some ways being raised Christian in Rochester Minnesota which was predominantly white mm -hmm. um, I also you know, it was very hard to locate myself and understand myself and understand my identities mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I'm openly queer now, but back in Rochester, Minnesota, I was, I felt so isolated, so alone. And um, Christianity in some ways gives me a framework that I, I still rely upon. I still base a lot of my spirituality, though um, in some ways it also limited me. And now coming to California for these past 10 years, I tried my best to um, you know, work with the uh, Khmer New Year in Oakland, our planning committee, um, and I, uh, to learn our ancestral ways of rituals, of traditions. And so many of our Buddhist traditions are with our Khmer language and Bali. And a lot of the things that I would have learned through dance, through culture, through our traditions would have been with our Khmer language. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have those traditions passed to me in my Christian church, I, I lost all of that language and all that opportunity to learn that language. Um, so our food ways, our dance, our music is all steeped with our language. And even more recently, we're partnering with more, you know, Khmer dancers and traditional dance. And I've learned that even, you know, the Apsada doing the dance, like that is like uh, a language in itself. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the gestures is a language and a way to passed on stories, mythology, lessons of life. Um, so that is more of my background. Um, you did mention I was an artist or am. Um, it's hard for me to embrace my artist side, though I miss it. Um, I was a filmmaker back in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And when I came back or I came to California in 2014, my first nonprofit job was to teach youth in an after-school summer program uh, filmmaking. So really that began my journey into the nonprofit world in 2014. Mm -hmm. And then I think I just bubbled up into do, doing a little bit more community um, engagement and community programs. And then I became a care coordinator, kind of a one-on-one uh, kind of peer counselor for a very Southeast Asian development center in the Tenderloin. And then that was the moment um, that same year, um, Siri was, you know, winning a grant that could um, be able to, um, you know, pay for my position here. And so really uh, my journey to Siri was uh, six years ago. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. And, you know, with this podcast, we also want to really highlight how faith is an aspect to social justice movements and also art. So I think faith and art and, you know, that intersection somehow it leads to the work that, you know, you and I both do. I know that being um, a Muslim really, you know, my faith really motivates my work. And I just love how it was the, the, the church that also maintained some of these traditional practices. So, yes. And one of the things that was unfortunate that I learned is some of the history of our Asian history, I didn't learn too much later in life. I didn't learn it in schools at all. And one of those things was the Khmer Rouge, unfortunately. I didn't learn it until later on in my life. So is there a way that you can share uh, with us the historical context of Cambodian refugees and explain to us a little bit about the 1.5 generation in Oakland? Yeah. You know, and it took a long time for me to understand and learn our history and um, of why we're here. And the language we have now is we wouldn't be here if they weren't there and who's they, and that's the U.S. involvement. Um, part of the last 50 years of diaspora, you know, 1975 is kind of the marker of, um, you know, one of the largest, if not the largest, refugee resettlement program in the U.S because of the Southeast Asian Wars. And the Southeast Asian Wars, um, you know, predominantly in our kind of historical memory of, in the US, you know, we call it the Vietnam War, right. though there was the secret war of Laos, there was the genocide in Cambodia, and of course there was a Vietnam War, though in Vietnam, they called it the American War. Mm. So there's so many different frameworks we can look at, you know, the Southeast Asian Wars. And really to uncover that part, you know, kind of the U.S. involvement, U.S. imperialism. We need to also understand, you know, colonialism and, and the impacts of French colonialism in Southeast Asia. And um, a lot of these is just part of uncovering how we got here um, and, and all of the geopolitical kind of relationships and dynamics between the different countries as well. Um, I think for me, what has been important and there's so many questions you know like i i didn't get to learn my own history in a space that i needed it until i went to uc berkeley mm -hmm. i'm a re, you know i'm proud to say i'm a re-entry student i recently got my undergrad uh, degree um, in ethnic studies at uc berkeley while i was at siri while i was doing this work in, in anti-deportation which we'll get to um, and I want to say I'm proud of that because I'm from a generation, you know, to understand the Cambodian story, to understand genocide, to understand the 1.5 generation, we also have to unpack model minority myth. We also have to unpack, you know, what we came, how we were resettled and where we were resettled. Mm. Because it's very easy, I think, for the community at large at first to just all of us say we're all Asian, but what does that really mean? You know, and part of this work is to disaggregate the data for data equity, to really understand that all of us come from different um, histories um, and very underrepresented, marginalized histories. Um, so if you were to say, you know, the bootstrap mentality of model minority myth that all Asians you know, are able to succeed and compare us and pit us against other races in this country that have already endured this, this, this system of this country is, is such a false identity. Um, and it's not the full story. It could be a story, but it's not the full story. And there's a, a, a fallacy of the model minority myth. And, um, but I didn't have that language being, a, you know, a queer Christian child of, in Rochester, Minnesota. And when I came out here, you know, ethnic studies was really kind of born out of the Bay Area. And um, I learned this history um, a lot from Professor Kataria Um, you know, our first um, Khmer woman to receive her PhD. And then I also learned our history through uh, the different ethnic studies programs um, to learn Black history, to learn you know, Latinx history and to learn our 
indigenous communities histories um, and our native Hawaiian histories were all tied in together around how to fight for liberation for all of us. Um, and for me, um, you know, the analysis now that we have that I didn't have five to six years ago is that we were the wedge between anti-Blackness and white supremacy. And, and I feel that. I feel like it's very easy to use a model like minority myth to show, um, you know, to pit the races against each other and to show like, well, if this community can do it, why can't you? And that is such a false way to see life. And, you know, for me, it's not just between, you know, being Cambodian or Vietnamese or Laos or Southeast Asia versus East Asia or the Global South versus the Global North. Um, or Western versus Eastern, like, again, there's so many frameworks we can talk about, you know, all of this. It's also our own colorism and classism within our own communities um, and unpacking that and unpacking privilege and unpacking um, how we got here. This is part of it. And all at the same time, I know this leads to the mental health and the PTSD, as you mentioned, and depression, anxiety, hypervigilance, um, panic attacks, nightmares, all the things that we've had to endure. Um, though there is something about not only seeing the deficit in our community. Like, do we have other frameworks to see our community? Is there a way to not pathologize our community? Because for me, you know, we can point towards trauma. We can all say, war and genocide in the diaspora and resettling into these um, neighborhoods in, across the U.S. that felt war-torn to us. You know, our 1.5 generation, if we can get to that point, we all came here in the 80s and 90s and resettled into communities that were already enduring violence, enduring the war on drugs, enduring mass incarceration, the, the school-to-prison pipeline. And we have so many, there's so much scholarship around those you know, those terms and, and those frameworks. Um, and then, then we come into that, that with the appearance of the model minority myth. And now we're, it feels like we're fighting battles everywhere, you know, and at the same time, just trying to survive. So what I want to say to uplift the 1.5 generation, they were a generation that felt like every system failed them. You know, all systems were kind of against this one small, vulnerable community. They were the first ones, siblings, you know, 1.5, we could say they were the ones that were 18 and under that, you know, that survived the genocide of war and then were resettled here, or even 25 and under, because we really look at youth up to 25. So if, if they were 25 and under and they came here, they were the first ones to have to figure out the school systems. Um, they felt very bullied and picked on by other people. They felt like they had to, in some ways, um, leave school to also pay the bills. They were the ones to have to translate, interpret for their parents and their families at social services to get benefits. Um, and oftentimes they are the ones caught up in the most vulnerable to the school to prison pipeline because you know on the streets is where they had to protect themselves. Um, so the 1.5 generation is what we are uncovering is such an opportunity to hold them, to hold them, to learn from them, to uplift their leadership, to hear their stories, to create safe spaces to hear their stories um, and to understand them and to not judge and to, and to really thank them. You know, um, I think it's the work of Siri has, has been first to hold the, the first generation, the elders that came here. Um, and we did a good job for a long time. And then it was really five years ago um, and close to even six years ago, but really five years ago when, um, you know, the coalition of partners in the Bay Area asked Siri to join the anti-deportation movement. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, we, Siri was, you know, this very special grassroots organization that focused on genocide survivors. Um, and it was looking at some of the youth though the missing piece was the 1.5 generation. Wow. And, you know, just listening to you share this, you know, what comes up to my mind is like the stigma of mental yeah. well-being, especially the, 
Asian community. And this really impacts it all. And one of the things that was, that stuck out in my mind learning more about Siri is that it's a culturally attuned service. It's a holistic health, uh, mental health service. Can you explain a little bit about that? Like, what, what does that mean? And because how were you able to discover the needs of this community and really apply it? No, we need a culturally attuned and a holistic way of approaching this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for lifting that part up. And again, I'm only human. I don't have all the answers. I make mistakes. And please forgive me all those out there that probably have a lot of lived experience in mental health and with our communities in our languages. Um, so this again is just the story I have as being somewhat in some ways an outsider inside Oakland. Mm. Um, outsider insider, you know, I, I feel in some ways the Khmer Oakland Bay Area community accepted me. Um, and I feel very humbled by that. I feel very much a part of our Khmer community, um, though I also feel like I want to do this in Minnesota one day, you know, and I want to help other communities in different enclaves. Every, every state and community and each different si uh, city prop most has their own elements of healing that makes them special. Like, in Minnesota, in Rhode Island, in Philadelphia, in Houston, in Chicago, in Seattle, Portland, etc. So for me, um, at Siri, trust was the foundation to be that we had to rebuild. You know, the genocide. One of the main, main key, key tools of genocide is to dismantle families, to separate families, to separate children from parents, from um, partners from each other, from the, you know, the genders from each other, from class, from everything. It just kind of separated everyone and, and really created a, you know, an entire generation era and environment of, of distrusting one another. And so rebuilding that took, is taking, it's taking this, these past 40 years that we've been here and plus 50 years that we've been here. So to me, trust comes from serving, serving the community, being humble, um, lowering yourself. Um, Jenna, I think to come to do mental health for the community, people cannot access mental health and talk about depression and PTSD and the memories of war and genocide if, you know, they need food in their bellies, mm -hmm. they need a roof over their head, they need, you know, their basic needs met first. So, um, you know, many folks here um, know that a lot main, our main work is care coordination. Um, other people call it case management, though we like to call it, it's care, it's coordinating care. Um, folks come here to receive help, to interpret, to advocate at school systems, in health systems, in, um, in our food systems. Um, and, and once we gain that trust, once we serve them, once they, feel like they are held by us in this way, then the mental health element can happen. Then they can bring in their uh, stories of genocide. Then they can talk about their issues they're having with their children or their worries for their children. And even, you know, their grandchildren now. And that is really kind of the base. And then, you know, what we're trying to learn and, and hope to really, um, uplift more at Siri is, you know, what does decolonizing mental health look like? And what does uplifting ancestral knowledge in healing work look like? What are the different modalities of healing? And that's what I mentioned before in the different enclaves. Everyone in the diaspora has their special sauce that makes them work and makes their community work. Mm -hmm. um, to me, um, we do, you know, have the Western modalities of healing which is, you know, talk therapy, peer support groups, um, you know, in some ways, psychiatry and the psychology of the Western model. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, with the lens of decolonizing mental health, meaning, you know, where did the stigma come from? Does the stigma of mental health only come from, like, a framework of capitalism that you're only, you know, valued as being a happy, person, you know, in the cog of the machine, 
you know, and, and we're only trying to heal you so that you could be happy in the system, you know? So decolonizing mental health to me is like, what are we healing for too? And, and um, you know, the ethnic studies and the decolonized mental health is also like the epistemology and ontology. You know, epistemology is like, and I'm probably gonna get this wrong. So any ethnic studies folks out there is like, how do you know you know what you know? Mm. You know, how do we, who studies knowledge? When, when do we get to be part of that conversation? And, and who gets to, to create knowledge? And, um, and ontology is, you know, how do we, who told you how to be? How are we in this world? Who told you how to be in this world? And what frameworks, who, told, who taught you that? And, and, and does our knowledge and how to be guide us? Mm. Um, so when I say all that, you know, the different modalities of healing to us at Siri is intergenerational, like gatherings for food, you know, just teaching youth how to serve food, teaching youth how to uh, retain recipes and cook food, um, having our, our elders, um, you know, uh, share their recipes with the community, feed and, you know, kind of dismantle scarcity in our community. So we have so much food all the time. That's yeah. Um, the different modalities for us here is, you know, integrating monks and um, Buddhist uh, ceremonies and having blessings um, and celebrating Khmer New Year, which is coming up. Um, we're celebrating tomorrow in Oakland at Peralta Hacienda Historical Park. Uh, we also host a Pichonben, our ancestral holiday at Presidio in San Francisco. And, and that is, to many people, one of the most important holidays. Um, mm -hmm. And that is brand new to me. I knew about Khmer New Year, though in the now living in the Bay Area, I learned about Pichon Ben and the ancestral holiday and the different rituals that we do for that. Um, you know, um, healing is that cultural attunement, as you said. I also like to say cultural humility. We may not know all the things that is part of our own culture, and and I don't. I also do not want to. Be be the representative of our cultural healing. And that's why I want to uplift everyone's way, their own healing elements within. To me, this is about um, my own healing journey too. Um, so as though I was raised very Christian and though many people are like, what is your spirituality? And I'm like, I don't know, I love nature. Um, I want to be part of nature and part of ways to grow naturally. Um, um, in the ways that I found to reground myself, I've, um, I really meditate and, and have joined some silent meditation retreats um, where, you know, I, I've been in spaces where um, meditation teachers really uplifted Southeast Asian monks to pass this oral tradition of the Buddha, Buddhist tradition of meditation and of Vipassana, of silent meditation. And, and that was such a beautiful thing to hear, you know, uh, meditation teachers that may not be Southeast Asian to really honor Southeast Asian roots that this was orally passed down for millennia um, and it's something that we have now and that is something in, that I hope to have more time for um, and to meditate with our community. Um, so often when people talk about silence and silence is so many things. Mm -hmm. Silence could be you know so loud because our parents that couldn't talk about genocide they they it was silent that they couldn't say it but i could see it in their face i could see it in their body language i could see it in their energy that they carry mm -hmm. um silence is also defiance you know like have we earned the right to hear their story have we made that space for them have we created safety for mm -hmm. our elders to tell that story to us in some ways i've heard in the scholarship is that Silence was the gift they gave us because they don't want to tell us these stories because it's too much to even bear for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then and to me, silence and meditation and silent retreat is really a moment for me to kind of purify myself and to purge. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. it brought me here and Again, I, um, Siri has been such a wonderful space for me um, 
to uncover these things about myself and the community and 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 it's also about play and practice and and allowing people to make mistakes along the way and and learning from those mistakes and learning from those failures and we will we will fail you know and that's okay yep. it's about brave spaces and courage and that's what i've seen a lot um in our community you know we're called the center for empowering refugees and immigrants and our executive director told me that it was really around five years ago that we really embraced our name and that's when we joined the anti-deportation movement that's when we, we held the 1.5 generation and, and the stigma of mental health wasn't just the stigma in our community the stigma of incarceration and deportation was part of 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 the the Khmer experience, the Southeast Asian experience. People being targeted by ICE, being separated by family, and then feeling that they could not share this with the community mm -hmm. um, and get help and ask for help and even, you know, join and stand together. Um, so that happened um, in 2019 for the first time at Siri with the support of Asian Prisoner Support Committee, mm -hmm. with Asian Law Caucus, and with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were more of the mental health, I was youth development, um, we worked primarily with elders, a little bit with youth groups, um, but very little with the 1.5 generation. And, and that's when, you know, our coalition partners asked Siri to be part of this because they needed mental support. We need the what, like what I saw were the mothers and wives and grandmothers and children and daughters and sisters, very women based and very queer led. Um, community that was in, also impacted mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the deportation and detention of prim very much so our, our male and men and male identified folks um, that were being detained. Um, so part of the fight, um, well, at first it wasn't the fight. At first, I didn't even know, you know, our elders didn't, even, didn't have the political analysis or didn't even understand what we were fighting mm -hmm. for. Um, they, they even said, should we be asking for forgiveness if our community members did something wrong and if they're getting deported shouldn't we be asking for forgiveness that's what they said because in that first um kind of historical moment where all of our coalition partners including interfaith alc apsc our impacted family members our children our youth organizers artists myself were sitting on the living room floor of our you know this victorian house that's where Syria was based for many years um, you know, that's when we first chanted with Nate Tan from APSC, um, when we fight, we win. And we, we said this kind of like very shy at first because this was our first time raising our voices. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we said this, um, we were tr still trying to believe it. And we're still trying to s believe when we fight, we win. And then an elder pulled me aside and said, well, isn't this about forgiveness? Should we be getting, should, and then I thought, well, who is supposed to forgive us? Where, where is forgiven, who gets to forgive? And so really what we fight for is that our folks, again, the 1.5 generation, most vulnerable to the deportation um, because we came here as refugees. We came here with um, green cards and a 1996 act is what really um, impacts us um, that if they're convicted of a felony they are then found um, they're able to be deported mm -hmm. um, so we're what we're fighting is that after they serve their time to society after they serve their full sentence and are found suitable for parole they should come to our community heal um, be part of our community um, uplift their leadership um, and be reintegrated and reunified. Um, though what happens is that ICE, you know, usually these folks are then directly transferred from cage to cage and then double punished and then detained and then deported from their family members. And this is what we fight. And this is the, in, the injustice. And this is what has happened um, for at least for Cambodians for the last 20 years. And, um, you know, every country has to re-sign or re sign an MOU or an agreement with America to or the U.S. to repatriate um, um, these community members and Cambodia had signed this in 2002 and you know there's almost a thousand folks that have been deported to Cambodia wow. so you know what is 
the story then to our community members here. And when the, so when we're talking about stigma of mental health, the stigma of deportation is very great in our community, um, where, where people, you know, felt very ashamed to talk about their deported family members and felt very alone and isolated, even if they wanted to, where could they go? And so five years ago, when we joined the anti-deportation movement, when we promised to stand by these families that were feeling, you know, also abandoned, because um, they were about to lose their, their loved ones to deportation. We promised to stand by them. And it was incredible to witness, to be part of that, mo that moment in 2019, where we saw daughters speak at City Hall to get resolutions passed. We saw elders and community members write petition letters and support letters, where we created actions and packed the ice courts to, at bond hearings, where we stood by families when the person, the community member actually got detained. Um, and we did three months of actions and everybody we fought for after those three months were released and came home. Wow. And that really built the foundation for Siri to join the movement, the anti-deportation movement, to build more wraparound services for families impacted by mm -hmm. incarceration and deportation and detention. And then the New Light program was really born from the coalition's um, need and also the communities need in Cambodia that they also for, felt forgotten too. They, you know, they're, after they're deported, after their campaign ends, after they, you know, you know, so many folks in across the states fight so hard with all of their love and all of their might to stop the deportations of many individuals. And then when these individuals get deported, then it, it's like as if the campaign stopped. Mm -hmm. And, and they also feel forgotten and in some ways left behind. Though so many, and you know, this is, again, things that we're learning. Um, so, so many different organizations across the states have tried so hard to find ways to uh, fight for their return, to change, you know, this policy agreement, this MOU agreement. Um, people in different states are fighting for different bills and policies to stop deportation and detention. We are part of a coalition. I set up California. And we have been doing the same um, with the Vision Act and then now the Home Act and, you know, these and all the bills have never passed yet. And we are trying our best to still find ways to bring relief and to reunite and return our folks that have been deported. Um, so all that being said, uh, New Light was born uh, three years ago through this effort of Cambodian defense and Southeast Asian defense and through these wraparound services and mental health care for all family members that were impacted. And now we're looking at the folks that have been deported to Cambodia and mm -hmm. learning about their stories and tracking them and holding space virtually in support groups and one-on-one -on -one sessions, trying to bring somewhat of the Siri model as best we can virtually, you know, ac across 13, 14 hours time difference, across thousands of miles and of sea. Um, and, we're, and we're trying our best and again, we're still learning. We're trying to come with a lot of humility. We're trying to uplift, you know, our folks in Cambodia, their lived experience. We're trying to create more pathways for them to be heard here in the U.S. in our coalition spaces and our spaces of organizing. We're trying to understand, you know, participatory defense models and and all the different things that people have now, the tools that we have now, and at the same time, you know, learning and unlearning. Um, how to do this um, that centers, you know, the impacted folks, but also centers the impacted systems of impacted family members, and also how to create another circle around the activists and organizers and providers that also feel very, like, um, in some ways can, be, can feel very burnt out from the movement itself. So how do we even create a larger circle around all of us that we're all held in this? safely um, and how to do this work for um, longevity, for again, the liberation for all of us. I wonder how can the city, what can the city do better? Or how can the city support your work? Like as of right now, what can they do to really help with the longevity of the work? Well, it's, yes, it's the city, um, you know, a lot of our grants, a lot of this work we do 
um, are from contracts and grants and funds that are very restricted. And I think a lot of nonprofit folks know the language of restricted or unrestricted funds. Um, restricted funds are often these, you know, wonderful grants that try to bring a lot of funding to programs to continue to do this work, though it comes with a lot of restrictions, meaning, you know, there's certain numbers, deliverables, certain things that we have to, you know, check off uh, on a list and um, to do the work. And, and unrestricted funds would be, you know, a way for us to dream, to dream bigger, to, um, to not only do what, you know, we wrote, you know, certain grants we write like two or three years ago, a community's needs and changes or the community needs are very different. And the landscape and the political landscape could be very different three years later. Um, and then we're still stuck with something that we pitched three years ago. So to me, it's, it's like, it's very slow moving. Um, so where, where can the trust be built where we can get more restricted funds uh, that we can be able to dream and serve the community in the moment now? Um, so again, I don't have all the answers to that. I think it's just, you know, coming to spaces like Siri. Um, to me, I think it's a lot about coalition work. How do we do this together so it's not um, our nonprofit for Southeast Asian genocide survivors um, or newly arrived refugees and immigrants at Siri? Um, because we've grown. We've, right. we're, we're not just Southeast Asian, Asian focused. Mm -hmm. We serve almost 14 to 15 languages now. Wow. And um, though at the same time, you know, the grants that we fight for, yeah. if we win it, that just means another community that is so deserving didn't get a chance to win it. So what is, how is there a way that all communities can be served, you know, equitably? Um, and and it's still, in some ways, still pitting us against each other. Um, although when other orgs win, and if we win, we're, I think every, you know, everyone supports each other in this work. Um, what I definitely see has helped Siri and our growth is coalitions and um, getting the support from so many coalition members um, and, and really just learning humbly from them and also finding our lane, you know, what is the special lane of Siri of mental health and now getting a little bit into advocacy um, and how do we be better partners with the folks around us? Um, how do we be accessible and say yes to certain things? And then how do we also have healthy boundaries and, and say no, you know, what is the compassionate no? Because we can't take on everything. Um, so to me, that's the, that's the part of the learning and unlearning and the language that we're in frameworks that we're co-creating together as a coalition. Right. Yeah. One of the most beautiful things that I've, you know, noticed about Siri is that, yes, you know, primarily, you know, in the beginning it was for the Cambodian community, but it is expanded. And thank you for showing the importance of cultivating multicultural communities and doing it in solidarity. And how can we cultivate better partnerships, you know, and doing the work together. Um, for folks, if you have any questions for Elijah, this is the time. Type it in the comment section. I always ask this to, uh, to all of my guests. If we did a public presentation and we took off the veil of love, what does love look like in this very present moment? What is safety? This is the second part of the question. What does safety look like? for you, mm. for the communities that you serve? What does safety mean to them? And then how does that tie into what love looks like right now? Mm. If we unveiled all of that and, and saw love and safety, to me, it's, it's really finding that peace and harmony within ourselves. You know, there's so much fight that we have for the world and a way to be to get to that peace. Um, and and I feel like in a community center like Siri, we're trying to find so many different, serve so many different vulnerable communities, folks that are vulnerable to 
the carceral system. And, and if we focus on something like that, um, we can understand how can we meet our folks with all of our basic needs? How can we understand their mental health? How can we help with families um, and, and do this work in holistic ways and in larger in the community? Um, so to me, safety looks like this intergenerational healing mm -hmm. that, that also centers the most vulnerable person in that community. Um, and love to me also looks like mercy and grace and forgiveness of each other and also accountability. You know, yeah. and if, if we've hurt and harmed each other, how do we have those accountable spaces? And if, if I've hurt you and harmed you, how am I accountable to you too? And um, I also want to, you know, with coalitions, but also in committees, you know, are there ways that even inside organizations that decision-making power is, is spread across horizontally um, and that the, the folks that we serve and the most vulnerable again have a voice, that they are part of what is the vision and, and helps us guide our work in the next years. Um, so safety to me is having that voice. Safety to me is also centering joy and centering mm -hmm what uplifts us and um, and if we center our joy in our work, does that change the way we do our work? Does that change the way we approach our people? Um, and That's revolutionary right there. That's <laughs> joy. That's something I don't, I don't hear a lot about, but that's such a holistic um, approach and something very new that we should definitely dive deeper into and integrate that into our work. And speaking about joy, you have been organizing um, the Kamai New Year, which is tomorrow. How can folks, where is it? What, you know, the time, information. So folks, my Oakland family, my Bay Area family, please go and support. Yes, um, here's a flyer. <laughs> so it's at Peralta Hacienda Historical Park on 2465 34th Avenue from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, it's going to be filled with, uh, you know, ancestral, cultural um, rituals and traditions and blessings. And there'll be dance, uh, Khmer dance, Khmer youth group dancers, um, and a fabulous troupe from Stockton, Motor Dog uh, Performing Arts and um, there'll be food and games, a lot of food. So bring, you know, um, bring empty bellies <laughs> to yeah. be filled up. Um, and a lot of community intergenerational celebration and resource fairs. Um, so come one, come all, um, be ready for the weather. Um, sunscreen, sun hats, blankets, if you want to sit down. And um, yeah, please join us. This is such a wonderful Oakland uh, celebration for all, and not just for Cambodian, uh, for all people to celebrate, um, you know, Khmer Joy. Um, so to me, this is part of, you know, my calling is how to uplift artists and youth and leaders and how to bring us all across differences um, to put on an event like this. Um, so our committee is comprised of um, all of these folks, like intergenerationally, the 1.5, the second, the third, the first, um, and we do this together, um, especially with the guidance of Ming Sambo, my mentor for these past um, um, almost 10 years now. So yeah, please come and hope to see you there. So it's Dai Chnam Tamai. Yes, and just, it's an honor. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your your insight, your wisdom, the history, you know, it's through these conversations that we can cultivate understanding and learn more about each other. Thank you for all the work that you've been doing. I wish I could make it to the Kamai New Year. I'm in Los Angeles, but um, in any way that I can, even I, I saw some of the gatherings, the community gatherings, cooking together, the, you know, the dancing together. I mean, I'm like, Next time I'm in Oakland, I definitely want to join you guys. But thank you so much for your time, Elijah. 
I mean, this is, I'm so honored. Thank you so much. Um, I pray that you are, you know, well and can continue this well, uh, this work. Send my love and greetings to the family. And I hope you have a blessed day. Thank you so much, Elijah. Thank you, Amina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And everyone, have a blessed day. And we'll see you on the next episode. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks, all. <laughs>